We're continuing our studies of lipid metabolism in Chapter 17, and in this lesson we'll be looking at the oxidation of fatty acids other than those that are even-numbered saturated chains. Let's first look at catabolism of unsaturated fatty acids. Recall that all naturally occurring double bonds in fatty acid chains are in the cis configuration. Let's look at the example of linoleate. It's an 18 carbon unsaturated chain. As you can see, the first cis double bond is between carbons 9 and 10. Until that point, beta oxidation is going to proceed normally until we get to round 4. Once we get to round 4, and that's illustrated on the top right over here, now we have a cis double bond between carbons 3 and 4. Recall that in the normal rounds of beta oxidation, in our first step we oxidized our saturated chain to produce a double bond. Well now we already have a double bond so we don't need step one. But the problem is the hydratase that adds water across that double bond needs the trans configuration to do so. And so now we need an isomerase to convert our cis 3-4 bond into a trans 2-3 bond. Now this uh, product can enter the regular rounds of beta oxidation at step 2, but remember we've skipped step 1 and that's the step where we generate QH2. Now when we get to the next round we have a new problem. We have a dienoyl. We have two double bonds. And so our first goal is to saturate one of those double bonds. We can only have one double bond for the next step in oxidation. That's going to cost us a molecule of NADPH so that we can reduce that double bond. Our product gives us a trans 3-4 bond, but we do need the trans 2-3, so here we need an isomerase to do that conversion for us. And again, we can now enter the rounds of regular beta oxidation at step 2. We have again bypassed step 1. So we have less QH2, which of course can be converted to more energy through electron transport. We've also consumed a molecule of NADPH, which represents more stored energy. I will not give you a problem where you need to calculate ATP yield from an unsaturated chain. You simply need to recognize why there's a lower energy yield because we bypass step one that produces QH2 and we consume NADPH in order to reduce some of those double bonds. So what happens in the oxidation of odd chain fatty acids? As humans, we make an even numbered fatty acid chains and we'll see why when we look at fatty acid synthesis. But there are plants and bacteria that make odd chains and they are in our diet so we need to be able to process them. Our final round will generate a molecule of acetyl-CoA, but we'll also have a three carbon fragment, propionyl-CoA. And our next steps are to convert that to acetyl-CoA. It takes eight steps to do so. In our first step, a carboxylase is going to add CO2 to carbon number two. Here's our propionyl-CoA. Carbon number two is in the alpha position to the carbonyl. That's where the CO2 gets added. Here's why. In propionyl-CoA, it gets added to the carbon adjacent to that carbonyl because we have this resonant structure and a carb anion intermediate. That's where that CO2, why the CO2 is going to add to that number two position. So <coughs> here's our product, methylmalonyl-CoA, and it costs us a molecule of ATP to do this. The product of that previous reaction was a racemic mix of methyl malonyl CoA, and so now we need a racemase to convert it R, convert them all to the R isomer. R and S are similar to D and L. Uh, there are certain priority rules for classifying them as R versus S, and we're not going to look at that at this time. Simply that we need this racemase to convert it all to the same chiral form. A mutase enzyme will then move that carboxyl group from the number two carbon to number three and look at our product, succinyl-CoA. I hope that sounds familiar because that is one of the intermediates in the citric acid cycle. 
and so now for further processing we can simply use the enzymes of the citric acid cycle and here we are within the mitochondrial matrix where all of those enzymes are present so we don't need a new set of enzymes we can use enzymes we already have so we can start with succinyl coa and then eventually form malate now we need a different enzyme separate from those that are part of the citric acid cycle. Malic enzyme is going to oxidatively decarboxylate malate to form pyruvate and that again should look pretty familiar. Now we can use pyruvate dehydrogenase complex con to convert that to acetyl-CoA and of course that complex is also in the mitochondrial matrix and now we can take our acetyl-CoA and send that through the citric acid cycle. Most oxidation does take place in the mitochondria but there is some that takes place in a separate organelle called a peroxisome. Here we have an electron micrograph and those dark areas represent the peroxisomes. It's membrane bound, it's a separate vesicle within the cell. Most eukaryotic cells have them. This is where we process long chain fatty acids and it differs in that first step. It's still in oxidation, so here's our acyl-CoA. We still oxidize it to convert that to an unsaturated trans bond. The electrons are tra transferred to an FAD cofactor on the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. However, instead of those electrons then being passed to Q, which is not present within the organelle, it's passed directly to oxygen and we generate hydrogen peroxide. That's where the organelle gets its name because of this peroxide product. So it's a kind of a sh chain shortening system. These shorter chains can then move to the mitochondria and go through the regular rounds of beta oxidation. These peroxisomes also contain enzymes that help to oxidize branched chain fatty acids. In our next video lesson, we're going to start to look at fatty acid synthesis. We'll look at the cofactors involved in that process. And we want to see if synthesis occurs in the mitochondrial matrix just as oxidation does.